Okay, so let's get right into Saturn. Let's begin with Saturn mythology. Now, Saturn or Saturnus, who was the Roman god in Roman mythology, basically uh, equivalent to the Greek Kronos, where they basically got him from. Now, you talking about we talking about fifth century BCE, right? So we had the Temple of Saturn built in Rome around 497 BCE. So this was something that they wasn't just you know messing around with. This was something serious for them to build the kind of monuments they built to Saturn and everything that surrounds Saturn mythology. These people were serious about Saturn. So now you also had the um, a festival in Rome called Saturnalia. Now Saturnalia was basically a festival that started December 17th to December 23rd and they basically uh, sacrificed, made a sacrifice to the uh, temple of Saturn. They exchanged gifts. They basically party. Now Saturnalia was also called the festival of light. They uh, basically lit a bunch of candles that celebrated their quest for uh, enlightenment, their quest for knowledge and truth. Now, also, you had, after the festival, you had the birthday of the unconquerable sun, which was uh, December 23rd. So, um, you know, this all goes into the whole winter solstice thing. This goes into Jesus and the whole Jesus mythology about him um, being born December 25th. It's not a coincidence that the birth and death of uh, Jesus is right around the same time when you get into the winter solstice. So you have Jesus dying on the cross of the Zodiac and rising again, you know, with the whole rising of the sun after the winter solstice. Remember, the sun is dead for a couple of days, then it rises again, symbolizing rebirth. This is what all this stuff is talking about. This is what it's getting into. But there's more to this because you got to understand which sun is talking about. You got to understand what what the um what Rome was really about, what their place was, what they was trying to do as far as getting out of the ancient world and the ancient world and bring it into place a new kind of um let's say mythology or a new kind of way to uh spread their rule and it's basically what took place when when you have Christianity come into place, which we're going to get into. So after they celebrated the birthday of the unconquerable sun, they celebrated the renewal of light, which was basically New Year's. So the Romans basically celebrated these things for over 500 years until Christianity came into play and basically, you know, outlawed everything and said everything was pagan and devil worship or what have you. Even they own worship, even the documentation of them being pagans or what have you, you know. Christianity came into play and then we eventually get Christmas and, uh, you know, New Year. So this is basically where this stuff comes from. It all really goes back to Saturn. So now we already know that they worship Saturn as a sun. Now, the thing we're going to get into in this video is you have to understand when was Saturn a sun. And a lot of people will tell you and from a lot of books that you will read that Saturn was a sun that wasn't that long ago. Now, you got to think about it. If there was worship in Saturn back in the 5th century BCE, that's not that long ago. That's in human history, you know, recorded history, so to speak. There was worship in Saturn as a sun. So think about it. It wasn't a, a telescope wasn't invented until like the 17th century. So they obviously were seeing something that pertains to Saturn. And it was something about Saturn that they seen that made them worship it besides, you know, just the rings. And this is, this is what we're going to get into because you got to understand about this Saturn as a sun and what it really pertains to. And a lot of times what you're going to find out in this video as well, when we think it's talking about the sun that we know of today, it's talking about Saturn. So now they had to have been able to see Saturn from Earth. And when you pay attention to the other planets that they are obsessed with in the occult, particularly uh, Mars and Venus. Now, I mentioned before, Venus, when it goes into its eight-year cycle, it does so in the shape of a five-pointed star. And we know the five-pointed star is associated with, you know, Satanism. It's associated with witchcraft. It's associated with uh, Lucifer, you know, the light bearer. And we know when a lot of people see this, this is immediately uh, what they run to. Now, also, what a lot of people don't realize is Venus and Mars 
aligns with Saturn to give us this, to give us the great light, to give us the bright star. This is a very ancient symbol that you're going to see a lot in this video and you're going to see a lot in the ancient world when you look. Now, also, during the formation of these three planets, of the planets aligning, you get this symbol of the crescent and the star. And again, this is a num another symbol that we see a lot in the ancient world. Now, most people, when you see the crescent and the star, you got to understand which one you're looking at. You got to understand if you're looking at ancient, ancient world symbol, which is what we see commonly uh, in um, ancient Mesopotamia. You see this with the Assyrians, the Babylonians or what have you. The formation, the beginning of the formation of these planets. But then you also get the crescent and star when you're looking at the moon and the sun which alludes to a lot of stuff in Islam, as I talked about before. Two separate things. And this is something that confused a lot of people in their research. you got to understand what's, what it's talking about. And if you don't understand about this formation that takes place and about this bright star, remember Venus is the bright and morning star. But you got to understand about the bright star and why they call it the bright star and what it all pertains to, which we're going to get into. Now, a lot of you have seen this before. Now, the Assyrians and the Babylonians, just like the ancient Egyptians, they left behind a lot of clues, a lot of artifacts that we can still see today. Now, in this depiction, you see the seated man. You see these three men and you see this wheel. Now, when you look at the wheel, look at the power coming from it. Look at the uh, shape, the design it's in. It kind of sort of uh, resembles the uh, morning star. I just showed you with the alignment of the planets. Now, to a lot of people, it represents Saturn. And when you look at the wheel, when you look at that alignment, it kind of sort of looks exactly like it. So there are other things in this uh, whole picture as well. When you look at the wavy lines on the ground, when you look at the waves in the body of the seated man, as well as the third man in line, they have waves in their body, bodies as well. Now, a lot of people believe that these waves represent uh, energy power. You see the waves on the wheel as well. This is supposed to represent the power of Saturn, the energy that Saturn is supposed to be putting out and uh, how it's affecting uh, us in reality. Now, the seated man is supposed to represent Samash. Samash is the Babylonian sun god who is associated with the planet Saturn. So now when a lot of people see this, this is something that a lot of people do not put together, the association of Samash and Saturn. So now a lot of people in the ancient world said that Samaj represents Saturn and Saturn being the dark star. It was another name they had for Saturn as the dark star, the dark star. This is something that you'll find throughout the ancient world. And in a lot of readings, you'll hear people refer to Saturn as the dark star being like this sun that basically puts out the same energy, has the same effects on the planet as the uh, sun that we know today, the morning sun. But this this sun has uh, the same effects, but also other effects on the planet. Remember, we can't ignore back in ancient times how much they worship the sun or Saturn. So supposedly there were two suns in the sky. This whole second sun that they are referring to was supposed to be the sun we know today. The sun we know today was is the second sun. And the first sun is supposed to be Saturn. Now, the symbol that the seated man or uh, Samaj is holding in his hand is supposed to represent uh, Thorazaz. Now, Thorazaz is a symbol that is seen all throughout the ancient world. You'll see it a lot when you understand it. Uh, you'll start putting it out a lot more. Now, Thorazaz is associated with monsters. It's associated with giants. It's associated with the god Thor and Malnir, you know, Thor's hammer. And we know that these things are uh, supposed to represent power. Thor's hammer has electricity. It's a powerful weapon. Thor's ass is also associated with the planet Mars. Now, again, these things start to come together when you start paying attention. And as I said, this, this glyph, this picture has a lot of uh, stuff in it that we can't get all into right now. But when you look at it, you also see the same type of representation in ancient Egypt. So the Assyrians and the Babylonians was both trying to tell us the same things, as well as a bunch of other cultures around the world. They was trying to point out something, and it pertains to Saturn, as we'll get into. But now, 
I want to uh, read from um, David uh, Talbert's book called The Saturn Myth. And I want you to understand, like, a lot of people got into the stuff. A lot of people really talk about this kind of information. And as you can see, he wanted to give us that symbol, as you can see uh, clearly on the front on the front page. And again, this is a really, really uh, ancient symbol. So it's saying here. Anyone attempting to trace the Saturn legend must reckon with the primordial God figure whom ancient races celebrated as the Great Father and who is said to have first organized the heavens and founded the antediluvian kingdom. Uh, antediluvian basically means a kingdom without the religious control that we basically see today. The antediluvian kingdom of peace and plenty, the golden age. While few of us today can locate Saturn in the starry sphere, the earliest astral religions insist that the planet God was once the all-powerful ruler of heaven. But paradoxically, they also declared that he resided on earth as a great king. He was also the father both of gods and men. This dual character of the great father has been the subject of a centuries-long but unresolved debate. Was he a living ancestor, subsequently exaggerated into a cosmic divinity, or was he originally a celestial god whom later myths reduced to human proportions? The overwhelming preoccupation of ancient ritual is with an ancient great god. The myths say that the god emerged alone from the cosmic sea as the preeminent power in the heavens. Out of watery chaos, remember the waters of noon, he produced a new order. The ancients worshipped him as the creator and the supreme lord of the cosmos. This uh, solitary god, according to the legend, founded a kingdom of unparalleled splendor. He was the divine ancestor of all earthly rulers. His kingdom, the prototype of the jest, and prosperous realm throughout his reign an unending spring prevailed the land produced freely and men knew neither labor nor war and the god king's towering form means giant ancients perceive the heaven man a primordial giant whose body was the newly organized cosmos the legends often present present the figure as the first man or primordial man whose history personified the struggle of good and evil. Whether emphasized the great father's uh, character uh, as creator, first king or heaven man, widespread traditions proclaim him to be the planet Saturn. In investigating the traits of the archaic God, we must give greatest way to the oldest astral religions, those which are closest to the original experience. The best material coming from ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia provides a remarkably coherent picture of the God and enables one to see the development and the distortions of the idea among later peoples. The ancients conceived Saturn as the visible intelligence bringing forth the cosmos as his own body and regulating its revolutions. Thus was the planet denominated the heaven man, a being eventually recalled as the prototype of the human race, the first ancestor. When Saturn departed the world, the golden age catastrophically ended. This is the universal tale of the dying God, the overthrown, first king or fallen first man. Whether betrayed by a dark force or chastised for having committed the forbidden sin or inflicted with old age. Notice this has to do with war and time and a weariness of mankind. The result is the same. A corruption of nature, which we are seeing today and a progressive worsening of the human condition, which we have seen. The story is the first, and one could almost say only theme of tragedy and drama and antiquity. Saturn's golden age came to a sudden and catastrophic end, either caused by or accompanied by the fall of the great God. Now, when you read that, when you, when you start getting into talks like this about Saturn, talking about the ancient uh, mythologies and fables, 
Saturn, when it's talking about this great man, it's talking about Saturn. Understand, it's God that he's talking about, this king that he's talking about. He is metaphorically talking about Saturn. It's a parable in that, too. You got to understand that these people, as I, as I said, they can't give it straight to you. They're giving it to you in parable. So what he's talking about, David uh, Tauber, he's talking about Saturn being this man. But again, it's a parable within that as well. I understand everybody talks about this war. So when I say this to you, that in ancient times, you know, they was talking about this war that happened. They was talking about the planet being at peace and stuff like that. Things were good. Something happened. And a lot of people trying to wrap their head around what that was. So, again, you had a planet of peace. Everything was fine. Everything was good. And something happened. And a lot of it is alluding to Saturn falling uh, from a, a sun, uh, from a star into basically what it is. And because of that, that brought about the destruction of the planet and the worsening, as he said, of people. And this is something that you are definitely going to see. I'm going to get into in this video as well. Now, when you get into this whole thing so far, when we talk about Samash, when you look at the depiction of these giants, and I talked about this before, you know, I believe that there was giants here. Everything in my research shows me that that's true. With all of the uh, claims from people who actually work for the Smithsonian, who says that they threw bones in the oceans, they've been hiding giant bones for decades. You got to understand that Smithsonian basically was going around covering up uh, these bones and covering up people finding these giant skeletons or what have you. A lot of the pictures in, that we see today, I don't believe is, is real, but some of them possibly could be. But um, you know, we know it's a cover up, but. Again, I talked about this before. So many ancient civilizations talking about giants and giants coming down to Earth. So if they talking about giants coming down to Earth, then this mean that, you know, they was there to see it, meaning that men was already here when these giants was coming down. So, again, this is stuff that is one. They try to hide, but you find it so in so many different places in antiquity about these giants coming down, you know, to the planet. Now, obviously, something happened to those ancient civilizations. You know, something happened that caused things to go from one way to, you know, to another. So now uh, we are basically left with a bunch of artifacts and a bunch of um, evidence. But, you know, really, we don't have the complete picture. We're still trying to put it together. So a lot of us are still left wondering, you know, what the hell happened? What's going on? Now, I talked about uh, Ptah talked about a tomb and the whole ancient Egyptian um, creation story. So now when you go back and you look at what the ancients was talking about, they clearly understood that something, you know, from space created Earth, created us. Now, the thing is, what the evidence is alluding to is that this has a lot to do with Saturn, that Saturn somehow has a lot to do with our creation. So when you go back and you start looking at the early depictions of God and of the sun, you know, you see these, you see this and this. Now, you know, we had it all wrong. You know, they had it all wrong when they first found these symbols. A lot of people saw these symbols and remember, they called it the sun symbol. Remember with the hole and you look at the other symbol and it was supposed to represent the zodiac. But these are really ancient, ancient, ancient symbols, symbols, really ancient. And what they represent is this. And they basically represent the aligning of the planets with Saturn. Now, when you look at that, it makes a lot more sense. One, one, when you look at the sun we have today, you're trying to figure out what is that dot in the middle? What is that hole there? Now, when you apply the whole image of the alignment of the planets, this symbol makes more sense. And then when you couple that with the uh the star with the whole light that it produces the other symbol makes sense as well now one of the other things this symbol with the crosshairs represent is um basically the four phases of a uh, solar configuration the four phases of solar configuration and these configurations basically is when the alignment is taking place and when it's basically uh, coming from out of alignment, you will get these solar configurations. Now, understand, we're talking about stuff that we see with the Assyrians, the whole, you know, uh, ancient Mesopotamia. Now, when you look over uh, these, uh, was it the Arabian Desert, you see this symbol. They still have it down there. You know, take a look. 
you know, you see the symbol of this solar configuration. And when you see those those carvings, when you see those drawings in the ground, this whole um, alignment uh, that's talking about this solar alignment, you know, it's something that was documented that you can't overlook. So, again, when we start looking into this thing, you know, a lot more, it's a lot more to Saturn that meets the eye. So now even when you look at the crescent and star, when you look at this solar configuration that gives us the crescent and star, it makes more sense that it pertains to Saturn and not with the moon and our sun, the sun that we know today. Because one, when you look at uh, Islam, we're talking about the worship of the Kaaba and they're walking around the Kaaba. The Kaaba is the black square. We know the black square has to do with Saturn. It is unmistakable. So again, what you're going to find, and I'm going through this because what you're going to find, as I said, is a lot of the things that we pertain to the sun we know of today does not equate to that. It is talking about Saturn as a sun. So now here's the thing. And this is one of the things that will confuse you. And unless you do, you want to know people that really do really deep research and you really question everything. This is why I question everything that they tell us, even the books that I, I read. I, I, I go and do the research and I question the sources, <clears throat> excuse me, because you have to, because a lot of people, even the uh, excerpt that I gave you uh, from uh, David Talbert's book, it's a lot of misconceptions in there. A lot of stuff that he don't understand clearly and a lot of mistakes. But when you a person that really research, you get this stuff. But what is known in esoteric circles, deep in esoteric circles and deeply in the occult is that the ancients, the people who was in the mystery schools, the people who really understood this information, their day began at night. Plain and simple. That makes a whole lot more sense when you hear that. Their day started at night. There is no way you can catalog and calculate the heavens that you can, you know, deify the things that they deify, like the moon and the sun. You get what I'm saying now? It makes more sense unless you begin your day at night. Because one, the sun that we know today, the sunlight, basically hid everything. You know, the heavens or, you know, space didn't really reveal itself until the sun went down. You, know, you start to understand what the Book of the Dead is talking about more, you know, going forth by day. You know, what it's talking about is alluding to the sun going down. We'll get into this a lot more later. But. Everything basically started to take place when the sun went down and then Saturn was visible. But, you know, it doesn't take away from any of the mythologies or uh, you can completely understand why the sun that we see in the sky today could be deified. Make no mistake. You know, it's not it's not a mistake that it is deified because it, it has the power that it has, as I talked about in the previous video. But when you understand that the ancients that they begin a day at night and that Saturn was also a sun, that there was two suns. When you understand this, a lot of things start to open up for you in your research and things start to make a lot more sense. And you start to see that, wait a minute, a lot of stuff that we ascribe to, you know, the sun we see outside today, it's really talking about Saturn and Saturn during the time it was a sun. And that becomes a lot more clear the deeper you go into the ancient world. So, again, almost every time we're looking at a depiction or something alluding to our sun in ancient times, it's not talking about the sun in the sky today. It's talking about Saturn as a sun. It's really important that you understand that this is a big deal, really big deal. So now when you go back and you, and you look, remember, you have in Judaism and Judaism is basically the worship of Greek mythology, which is the worship of, you know, um, basically stealing from Egyptian mythology. But again, when you break down Greek mythology, it's getting into the worship of Kronos, Saturn, still dealing with Saturn. Remember, the Jews, it all goes back to um, Greek. Remember, as I pointed out in my videos, how the Greeks, the Greeks, uh, Ptolemy II of Philadelphia is how they created Judaism or what have you. Remember, the Old Testament, everything. All parallels from Greek mythology, which deals with Kronos and the worship of Saturn. This is why the Jews have the black square. You know, the black square you see on the head. You, I know you've seen that before. So you see why the uh, Jews worship on Saturday or Saturn day. 
Even when you look at the uh, ancient Phoenicians, they worship L. L represents Saturn. So we have the Greeks worshiping Kronos, Saturn, dealing with, uh, you know, Judaism, the worship of uh, Greek mythology, which goes back to Saturn. Same thing with ancient Phoenicians, Saturn. When you look at Rome, they have the worship of Saturnus, which is, again, Saturn. So we find it everywhere in the ancient world. There's a lot more to that, but I want to go back. Let's go back to Atum Ra or Atum Re, however you want to pronounce it. And let's look at, you know, this whole thing with the sun. You know, we know that Ra is the eye, you know, the eye of Ra. We know that Ra represents the sun. So the whole thing is, you know, does the sun today, the sun that we have, have anything to do with an eye? No. So when a lot of people look at Ra as being the sun or Jesus, Horus being the sun or Horus and Jesus being the same, they are confused. Now, it's not a problem that a lot of people get confused by this. A lot of people uh, make this um, connection because it's just common sense to put it as the sun we know of today. But when you understand that it's talking about Saturn as a sun, it makes a lot more sense. Does Saturn have an eye? Yes, Saturn has an eye. So we know about Saturn being, you know, having a storm. We know how Saturn with the shape, how it looks like an eye looking down. When you look at the formation of Saturn, when it's starting to uh, for formate or come into formation with the uh, planet Mars and uh, with Venus, Again, when you see the crescent shape, the crescent in the star, then look at Lord of the Rings. Let's look at Sauron. Remember, the eye of Sauron represents that shape. You see it as a burning eye, representing Saturn as a sun. Remember, Saturn, the Lord of the Rings. And this is where the stuff is going to. So we can see clearly that the eye is representing Saturn. And this is what it's trying to tell you. 